Okay. Um, that short break allowed us to regroup a little, but I didn't want to delay too much. So our last speaker for today is going to be Tom Darlington. Tom is a staff scientist at Columbia University and also a doctoral candidate at the University of California, Berkeley. So Tom, if you're ready, please share your screen. I'm ready, I'll share right now. Yeah, that's the right one. Go to presentation mode. Nope, there we go. My pointer ready. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for sticking around. Uh, it's a long you know, section of talks. Pleasure to be the last one. I hope everyone isn't too tired from all the signs. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Tom. I'm coming here from New York City, uh, trapped in my apartment. Um, yeah, as Martin said, I'm a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley in the Department of Physics. Um, I'm actually writing my dissertation right now. So it's actually fairly productive to be confined in my apartment and not, not being able to go anywhere. So it's pretty, pretty happy to share some of my work with you. It's going to be a good bookend because it's very complimentary to all the work that uh, Andre showed you before. So it's going to be doing a lot of TERS and TPL and 2D materials, in particular the monolayer transistor metal dicalcogenides, which are semiconducting. Uh, in particular, I'm going to look at the interplay of strain and how they influence the excitons in these materials. And the strain here is going to be provided by these, you can't quite see it, but there's supposed to be a bubble here right below the uh, uh, different departments listed. I want to give a big shout out, especially to Andre here, because he was pretty instrumental in taking a lot of the early data on this project. And we're just now getting that out into a couple of papers, which I'll show you coming down the line. And to not delay too long, I'll just jump into it. Yes. So yeah, we're using TERS and TEPL. These are a subset of a more broad class of near field techniques called aperture scanning near field optical microscopy, or ASNOM, as it tends to be called. This is just basically contrasted with other near field scanning techniques, which are more aperture based. That was the original version of near field. The basic idea is we want to use a metallized AFM tip to locally enhance the field so we can get high resolution optical spectroscopy and microscopy of any sample of interest. So the general problem here, if you're doing like say confocal microscopy, we have a focus laser spot and a TMD, you've got a pretty broad area that's gonna be illuminated. If it's all luminescent, luminescent like the TMDs are, that is they fluoresce or phosphoresce and emit light, or they're gonna scatter um, like exciting phonons and in elastic scatter some photons and you get some Raman, et cetera. You gotta outcompete all this you know, the fraction limited um, illuminated area of the sample to, in order to get the nanoscale resolution that you want. So the strategy to do this is you want to couple your incoming photons, some sort of light matter interaction. And the light matter interaction here is provided by the plasma at the surface of metallized AFM tip. So the idea is we're going to tune our laser sets that we're going to set a localized surface plasma. Plasma is an oscillation of the localized electrons in the metal. That lock is a local source of optical field and will enhance the field right below the tip. If we do it just right, we'll get a very concentrated area of field that we then scan over the sample and build a high resolution image of our thing of interest. So, but the big key is you really need a lot of enhancements in order to see this because you got a really small volume that has to compete with this really big volume of material. So, if you just do the basic math, you got to get really high electric field enhancements any order of 100 to 1,000 or even greater. But with good quality tips, and especially if you go in, this, uh, in Gatineau geometry, as Patrick and Andre shows you, that's become, become pretty routine. And you can get some very beautiful images, especially cheating materials, which I'm going to jump into right now. And just to give a brief sort of overview of what an exciton is, they're basically a kind of hydrogen like excitation in the material. So the idea is that when you hit it, um, say, a monolayer semiconductor right here, photon comes in, it'll excite an electron, give it some energy, it'll leave behind a little pocket of positive charge called a hole, it'll interact via the Coulomb interaction, turn a bound state that's kind of like a hydrogen, hydrogen atom inside the material. 
they're usually pretty weak in most semiconductors, especially free D semiconductors. The binding energies are only like a few milli electron volts. But because these these 2D, the TMDCs are two dimensional, you get a very strong interaction of these electron and holes, which give you a very strong binding energy of like hundreds of milli electron volts. So you can see them even at room temperature, which usually they're only seen at low temperature, classical semiconductors like gallium arsenide. And this leads to is ultra strong light matter interactions, where even though these materials are chemically thin, they're only free atoms thick, they'll absorb greater than 10% of the light you throw at them. So even with a microscope, you can see in a less than a nanometer thick sample just by doing normal you know, transmission or back reflection absorption microscopy. So, talking about nanobubbles and what are nanobubbles, they're more or less self explanatory. So, when you make these materials, what you often do is, is exfoliate them. They're common big bulk crystals where the individual layers are held together by comparatively weak Waals forces. You can split off a layer with Scott's tape, which is another method, and deposit layers on the surface of interest. You can do it multiple times to make heterostructures. So, this particular sample I'm showing you here is a heterostructure of toxin that's on and boron nitride. You got a big thick piece of HBN. A monolayer of tungsten diselenide on top of that, and then on top, capping layer of HBN. The cap's only part of the sample, so we got a kind of a sandwich structure here, a half sandwich structure right here. Mostly, I'm going to talk about the exposed part here, where we're going to investigate with TERS and TEPL. So the bubbles form is when any sort of trapped gases can't escape when the layer gets deposited, and they instead aggregate together, being pushed around by the minerals attraction of the two materials. They form a little pocket of pressure that will then push up against the top material, forming a bubble. And the key aspect is that when it does this, when they aggregate together and they push up, they're going to form a little island of strain. That is, they're going to stretch the top layer a bit. It's going to increase and decrease depending on where you are. So the strain profile is going to be inhomogeneous. This can lead to some interesting physical effects that I'm going to jump into. Typical sizes, they usually have an aspect ratio of maybe one. 0.1 or sometimes higher. So that is if they're often like 100 nanometers long in diameter and about 10 or so nanometers high. So they can be bigger. You can get them maybe 40 nanometers high or even smaller. Like you can get nanobubbles that are only like one nanometer or less high. And just to give a size comparison, this is about the size of this thing that we're hiding from right now. So these coronaviruses are about 125 nanometers across. So they're really like virus size little features in our sample that we really need high resolution optics to investigate. It's doing naturalist and uh, TERS and TEPL. So this is the same sample, just looking at it from the top. So this is the atomic force of microscopy. Right, um, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but there is there is a little choppy signal. It seems like you're getting a some kind of interference on your internet connection. Mm -hmm. So we can try going for a couple minutes, but if that doesn't work, you can always call in and I can let you talk through the phone. You can still present your slides the way you are presenting now. I see. Should I go back a slide or should I just continue? Do you have a phone around you that you could use? I do have a phone around me. Should I call in? Yeah, try calling in. Okay. How do I call in? What's the number so I go? H three three, eight three three, three zero two, three zero two, one five three six, one five three six. Calling. Go to speaker. Welcome to Zoom. Enter your meeting ID followed by pound. Uh, what's the mean ID again? 967. 967. Nine, 935. Is that 135? 935. 935. 203. 203. Enter your participant ID followed by pound. Otherwise, just press pound to continue. Just press pound. You have joined the meeting as an attendee. Okay. All right, Tom, you might need to mute. Okay, you should be able to. Yeah, just mute it. 
can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Sorry for the trouble, everyone. Seems a lot of people are using the internet, probably in New York City. Uh, yes, we so, can hear you. I don't know if you can hear me. I can hear you. Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right, great. Like a commercial. Okay, so I was just showing this AFN of the sample. So this is, again, constant dicellin and boron nitride. We're going to show you some images of bubbles just now. And if you, say, if you did spectroscopy and tungsten dicellin at room temperature, you get a spectrum that looks like this. So this, you basically just have a strong emission peak with an asymmetric tail centered at about 750 nanometers. I'm going to get my laser pointer back. Yeah. If you were to do a confocal peel of this sample and integrate just the exciton energy, you get a very, if it goes, fairly blurry map. It's very hard to see what, what the effect of nanobubbles is if you just do normal diffraction loads spectroscopy. This is some of the first data we did of Andre. If you go to then to the near field, you get a very high resolution image. You, you can really see the top step here, the top PN. It really shows that there's really one subpixel line that cuts across the image like this. So this is integrating just the uh, exciton photoluminescence peak, kind of excluding the lower energy tail. I did that purposely because we can then focus on the tail emission. And when we do that, you really see these nanobubbles light up really well. So they're really small localized centers that emit at lower energies in the main exciton. And if I integrate the PL or integrate do a spatial average of the PL pixels in this area, get the PL spectrum, compare it to that spectrum before, you can see you have a very broad, because we have an average spectra, low energy tail, it's about 100 milli electron volts below the main exciton. So that we can attribute to the effect of string, so this is just an average spectrum. You can see that there's a dramatic effect on the exciton energies, but even just a little bit of strain. And the strain in here on average should be about 1%, just to give you a scale. Okay. Just to give some motivations before I jump into more meat of my presentation of my data, like why you might care about looking at inhomogeneous strain states and tungsten dicellinite and 2D materials more broadly. And the reason is, is that when people did low temperature spectroscopy on similar type samples, like nanobubbles here, or just like pits where you posit tungsten dicellinite and it conforms to a depression in the sample or other strategies, they done a direct correlation between the inhomogeneous strain and the emergence of single photon sources at low temperatures. So why you might care about a single photon source is that these are basically the building, basic building blocks of any sort of quantum optics applications. You can do, can make basically qubits out of single photon sources through various optical setups. So this potentially gives you a way to controllably place quantum materials where you want and extend it to the two dimensional sample just by applying a little bit of strain through some strategy. And there are highlights some here. Yeah, this one's really nice for Matt Rosenberger's group, or Matt Rosenberger and Barry Jonker's group at the Naval Research Lab, where they did like a typewriter. They put a little layer of PMMA, that's a nice sound on top of it, go up an AFM and push it down. You can basically write whatever structure you want uh, that will then be single photon emitting once you go to appropriate temperature. And there are many others, some more recent ones I haven't quite included in this list, it's a hot topic now is creating and controlling single photon emitters in the solid state. And this is one of the candidate materials. So uh, this is kind of give an outline of the kind of broad sections of nanobubble spectroscopy I'm going to be showing you today. I'm going to just start with kind of a brief aside on tungsten disulfide. This is again just to uh, highlight an easy way you can kind of estimate the strain based on the AFM topography. Then I'm going to go on to some of the recent work or not so research that we've done on tungsten dicellinite that we're just now getting published uh, on the nanobubble I showed you before. Then look at some gap mode versions, gap mode measurements on tungsten dicellinite and also on heterostructures of moly dicellinite and tungsten dicellinite. And then some very recent, more experimental work, more spec just beginning work, it's a preliminary work, I should say, about controlling the strain state and a coupling to gap mode plasmons, so maybe getting strong coupling type phenomenon. Um, in these monolayer semiconductors. So, and just a uh, focus on this one first. So, this is the broader AFM where that little subsetting came from. We do a T PL TERS image of that. So this was taken by Andre. The sample is made by Jeep Jarawali, University of Pennsylvania. You get a really sort of, you know, bright map of all the nanobubbles. They really light up 
like Christmas trees in this sample. If you look at the spectra from the number over here, you see you got a lot of photoluminescence. And on top of that, you got some very strong TERS or Raman signal for the vibrations of the tungsten disulfide. Sulfide, excuse me. So the question we had, we struggled with for a little while, is like, how do you get the strain in these samples? And this is just a zoom in of one nanobubble. You can kind of see the various spectra to highlight it. Yeah, yeah. So the problem is, like, how do you get an estimation of the strain just by looking at the deflection measured via AFM? And you can just model it as a plate. This has been done a lot for graphene bubbles or similar type structures in graphene and HBN. But even a plate model, it's a fully classical, you know, um, a very elasticity model, continuum model that you know, engineers solve all the time. The governing equations are actually kind of nasty. Like this is, these are called the so-called Popple von Karman plate equations. They're highly nonlinear. You got a lot of couple of four order derivatives. So the solving them in general is actually a pretty tricky problem. But we discovered that when you have the topography already, that you already know what the deflection is, it actually simplifies quite a bit. And you only really need this equation here. It's actually a linear equation with basically the curvature, the Gaussian curvature of the nanobubble as a source. So we took this method and we sort of back solved it based on the AFM topography. And then we can get the full strain tensor to every point in the nanobubble. And this is the result if you apply this, that solving this equation for this uh, AFM profile. And you get a very complicated strain profile that looks like this. You get a couple of different hot spots that if you, I don't have the spectra on hand, but they correlate to the 15 exciton energies of spectra I showed you in the previous nanobubble. So it works, and the nice thing about it is you can apply it to large areas, so we can go for the full nanobubble and uh, get, get the strain tensor at every point. And a way we can measure, let's verify that it's, work, it's working, is that we can look on these, we can use the Raman modes as an independent measure of the strain by looking at their redshift. So the idea is you look for something called the Grimson parameter, which basically gives you a scale of how much the vibration of motor shift for some amount of stretching. It was given by this little Greek letter here. So when you stretch it, you have, you have tensile strain. If you have a positive Grunison parameter, you expect the modes to shift like this. So to test the method, we apply, solve the strain for a, a bunch of nanobubbles in, in the area and average them up to get higher signal to noise because actually the cysts of strain and TND is actually very subtle. It's only like a few wave numbers for a percent. We can get see how the mode shifts as the strain increases, as I'm showing here in this plot. And then we can fit a slope and compare it to what's been observed previously for other experimental techniques. It actually agrees quite well. So the value of the Grunston parameter using like a simple you know plate bending technique done by Abby Pasipapes group at Columbia, about 0.57. With this from this slope, you get a value about 0.54. So it seems to work. You can get a very good idea of what the strain is by just back solving a very, very simple numerical recipe, the um, topography that you measure by AFM. It's not very computationally intensive, and all you need is a good quality AFM image. AFMs are very common in multiple laboratories. So I'm hoping this will be a very accessible way to get an idea of what your average strain will be, and any sort of bubble-like feature you find in a 2D semiconductor or anything that can, can be approximated as a thin plate. Okay, so to move on to the more meaty part, the really separate one excited to talk about, and that is doing looking at the localized excitons and tungsten uh, diselenide uh, inside these nanobubbles. So this is uh, actually the same sample I showed you before, or zooming in on these nanobubbles here. So one bubble here is about 125 nanometers across, and we're gonna look at some individual spectra, looking at on DEPL spectra at various points. So it's hard to see them, but there's some crosses here that, uh, of single pixel spectra that I'll then show here on the right. And you can see even uh, within like 100 nanometers or even less, maybe 30 or so nanometers, you have distinct spectra of these red shifted exciton states. So indicating that you have a different strain state leading to different amounts of sifting of the exciton energy, different amounts of exciton localization as you move from one part, of the one part of the nanobubble to the next. And in particular, the edges of these nanobubbles tend to have a very, like, unusually red -sifted. If it was just a classical plate you might, that was purely strictly symmetric, you would expect the max strain to be right here at the center. But judging by the energy, we'd say it's probably the red peak is the highest strain. So we were really confused about this for a while. We played for different ways of solving the strain. 
But like an experimentalist, even though we don't understand something, we just keep taking data. And a friend of mine in Nabe Pasapapi's group had this sample where he was looking at bilayers of toxin diselenide. And for whatever recipe he did, he just managed to make a whole bunch of nanobubbles all over the place. So he gave it to us, so we were to do some TEPL. When we look at the main exotone, we get a home, very homogeneous map, kind of the, it's very similar to the sample I showed you before. And when we look at the low energy, we see the nanobubbles start to show up. Well, we can see them fairly well. They're really hard to pick out, especially when you go to the bilayer area, where the nanobubbles are presumably between the two layers of toxin diselenide. So we had the idea is that if we set exciting above the band gap, like here we're using the 643 or a HENI laser, so we're well above the optical band gap of toxin diselenide, why don't we excite just below the main exciton with the 785 laser? Thereby, we're going to cut down a lot of the main exciton background and just get these nanobubbles to show up. This will prove our contrast so we can get a lot more nice imaging. And we did that, and it works. But I'm sur very surprisingly, we actually saw a lot of donut shapes start to show up. So in addition to seeing some bright nanobubbles in the monolayer, we see all these donut shapes that some occur in the monolayer, but a lot of them occur in the bilayer region. So we mulled over this for a while. We thought maybe it was some sort of instrument response artifact in our sample. But it turned out when we looked at the data a bit more carefully, the donut feature was not actually inside the, uh, was actually in the intensity distribution. It's actually in the energy. So if I do uh, calculations called a spectral median, just kind of look at the center of mass of the emission spectra for every pixel, you get a map that looks like this. So you can still see the donut feature kind of show up. That's a little bit harder with this color scale. They really, you really see a very pronounced donut-like energy feature in these larger nanobubbles in the modeler. We have the reddest sift of emission right at the edges and bl relatively bluer emission at the centers. So this was interesting, but right about the time I did this cat analysis on the data set, a nice theory paper came out from Frank Yanka's group at the University of Bremen out in Germany. They were looking at exactly that. What do nanobubbles, and especially the strange state of nanobubbles, what is their effect on the electronic structure? In this case, they did look at MOS2, but it should apply to multiple KMDs as well. And what they found out is almost exactly what we saw. The strain effect that they predicted should have a more predominant effect around the edges. And for various different values of the um, aspect ratios, so the radius of the height, ratio of the height to the radius, we even get greater and greater localization. They attributed this to the formation of atomic scale wrinkling, where the last will spontaneously form a very sharp localized area of strain to, in order to achieve you know, a lower st stretching energy state over the nanobubble as a whole. And this can lead to ultra strong localization of the excitons, where they really become localized to specific points around the nanobubble, not generally delocalized as we see here. But any one of these cases was exciting for us because it looked exactly like that map I just showed you in the previous slide. So we got in contact with them. The nice thing about their theory calculations, they use something called valence force field theory, and it can take in arbitrarily height, um, height profiles of a nanobubble, and then they can feed that into the tight binding calculations and get the predictive lo um, localization. So we sent them the AFM of the main nanobubble I showed you a couple slides ago. They did the calculation to get the what the confined potential for the excitons. And as expected from the previous slide, they get a strong confinement around the edges. We compare that to our data taken experimentally of the main ex of the localized exciton at emission energy center. So here I'm going to fit a Gaussian to the peak in this gap. Whereabout is the peak emission for that um, low energy emission below the main exciton? Plot it spatially, and you get a spatial profile that looks very similar the confinement, strength confinement profile seen in the theory calculation. So experiment in the theory, we agree quite well. But we didn't stop there. We had a lot of other nanobubbles, especially in the sample from Heavy Posse Coffee's group. So we picked out a couple of them and sent the AFMs over to Bremen. They did the calculations. So here's our experimental data. Compare that to the confined potentials, confined potentials that calculate the theory. You get a very correlate strong correlation as we see before. They can go further and they can use Fermi's golden rule and to get an idea of what the city emission profile look. Um, so basically use Fermi's golden rule approach to get which of the, for the optically active states, which of the energies be at very, various points in the spatial benefit of the nanobubble. And we get a surprising correlation when we do that calculation between 
their theory in our experiment. So this is really exciting. I mean, this is all room temperature. This isn't like low temperature spectroscopy. I'm going to get a very strong correlation of electric uh, theory in experiment. It's really hard to do when you go down to these scales. So that's basically the summary right here. It's going to summarize it in words. Just kind of want to highlight that we've written this up. We've submitted it, gotten the reviews back, and about to resubmit it. But we have it live on the archive right now, so if anyone wants to check out this work, go to this link right here. Uh, hopefully we'll get it into the journal soon and have some nice letterhead that you guys can cite. Okay, so now I want to go into the sort of third part of my talk and talk about doing gap mode measurements on TMDs and nanobubbles and TMDs. Talk a, first a bit about doing um, high resolution TPL on Tesla cellulite again. Then we'll move on to the heterostructures and look at maybe some interlarics of time on the TEPL mission. So here I'm going to look at a nice thing about the high resolution of gap motors. We can really look at very small nanobubbles, so truly nanoscale bubbles. So this is a nanobubble with a radius of about 50 nanometers or so. It did a high resolution TEPL map. So scale bar here 30. And we see we have, this is the localized. Um, it's the integrated map, the localized exoton emission, like before. We see that the emission is very strongly localized at specific points. So they seem kind of like a lobe right like structure. And we can look at various point spectra and get an idea. We got one here, red one here, blue one here. This is we're integrating this window right about in these peaks here. One thing you'll notice is that right when we have low, you know, strong localized exoton emission, we also get strong TERS. And we can maybe attribute that that we're changing the resonance condition. As the exciton states move to be more resonant with the laser, we get more Raman scattering, giving us stronger <coughs> modes in the, that right on top of our TEPL data. <coughs> Pardon me. <laughs> All right. So can I ask a question? We see this lobe-like structure. Is it reflected in neighboring nanobubbles in the sample? And uh, I did a lot of scans, and it seems to be the case. So Integrating the same window for each of these nanobubbles, see that the lobes tend to appear right around the same axis. They're all horizontally distributed. For nanobubbles, they'll have slightly various shapes in the sample. And this is kind of expected from the theory, where you see that the wrinkling and basically the localization when you get sufficiently high aspect ratio isn't random. It actually relates to the relative orientation of the lattice. So if you do have the presence of atomic scale wrinkling, they should have a consistent orientation for nanobubbles in the same area of a crystal or basically a single crystal, which these guys are. So presumably, this might reflect the nanoscale wrinkling that's going on below the resolution we can image, but maybe within the, within the resolution of an alternate technique like STM. We're working on doing these kind of correlated experiments with Abe's group, see if we can really characterize the top or correlated formation of atomic wrinkles and optical properties. So one thing this sample gives us um, I mentioned before that we, when we have strong localized exciton emission, we also get, tend to get strong TERS emission. And I did a, basically a high resolution map of this particular nanobubble here to see like how long does that correlation hold up spatially. So doing a really high pixel density, so these are about three nanometer pixels. This over this area, I should have drawn a box, but it's about this region right here. So we, integrating the same window, we more or less reproduce the same intensity distribution of the two lobes. We have the Raman, so we can pick out the Raman, subtract off the PO, and see what the intensity map looks like for the TERS. And we see a map that looks like this. If you, there is some correlation if you look. I mean, there's some bright Raman here that correlates the bright low localized exciton emission here. But it's not a one-to-one -one correlation. You have an extended feature here that doesn't really show up here. This area kind of correlates to this area, and maybe not so much. So there is an association when you get these localized exciton states that are more resonant, you get more Rama, more Rama intensity, but it's not a one-to-one. -one. So it's very, might be indicative of a very complicated nanoscale train, strain distribution. So to get an idea of that, I looked, I used a higher resolution grading and kind of looked at various points within the nanobubble. So off the nanobubble, then on to these various bright spots and see what the Raman spectrum looks like. And this is kind of like resonant TERS spectroscopy. We're not changing our excitation laser here, but what we're doing is we're changing the relative position of the band gap. So we're changing the absorption in the material. So it's kind of like doing resonant TERS. This will give us a lot of information of both the Raman modes, but also the coupling of the Raman modes to the exciton. So when you're off the sample, 
say like a point right here, because we're below the band gap, we're not resonant with any electronic transition testing diselenide, because this is just the normal flat material, presumably, maybe a little bit of residual strain. We just get the first order of Raman active modes. But very quickly, as we move to various points in the nanobubble, you see a dramatic shift in the Raman profile. So it's obviously wider once you go to these um, brighter parts of the TERS map. Moreover, you, you can see these, like the region here, tends to show up much more strongly. Then you have an obvious splitting here that may indicate, you know, some sort of looking at the degeneracy of the in-plane vibration, which is too full of degenerates. Maybe this is this mode here is accepting the low energies, which we might expect from the given the amount of strain. To, to give an idea of what these modes are, is that we can look at you know paper published recently in Tita Materials. These mostly correspond to um, acoustic modes, but also the optical modes at the K point in the Brion zone. And that's interesting to me because I think this might relate to the exciton photon coupling, because the K point, of course, is where the exciton is within this material. So it seems that we have very strong coupling of the K point photons with the exciton in this material. That might, um, that might have related to some very interesting phenomena that's been published recently in Nature Communications, like maybe some of these are chiral phonons, maybe that have like a torsional mode. So there's a lot of work, it's more, it's more of a speculative answer, but there's a lot of work to do on understanding the interaction of the exitons and the phonons in these materials. Uh, especially in the presence of something like high scale or a lot of nanoscale strain. So, that was some recent work doing, just looking at a single layer of TMDs, but what if we go to like a hetero layer of TMD? In this case, look at a heterostructure of MOSE2 and WSE2. And uh, what these materials have is they have the presence of what's called interlayer excitons. That is, we still have the excitons we have before, the excitons that sit inside a single layer, so they have MOSE2. WSE2, but also the excitons can be shared between the two materials. So you imagine if your photon comes in, it's going to excite excitons in both materials. Say we're like 633 or above the band gaps of MOSE2 and WSE2, exciton in one and exciton in the other. Because we have this type 2 band alignment, it's actually energy, energetically stable for the electron of WSE2 to hop to the MOSE2, and obvi the obvious case for the whole in MOSE2 to jump to the WSE2. So you get the formation of these interlayer acetons that are shared between the two materials. So these differ in a couple of important ways from the normal intralayer excitons. One tend to be indirect because they exist at the they're still at the K points inside the Brion zone and usually have some sort of lattice mismatch or maybe some twist angle. So the lowest point of the valence band is no longer the highest point. I mean the highest point of the valence band nor the lowest lowest point of the conduction band. Their momentum indirect. They're spatially separated, so they have a permanent um, static dipole moment. They're not, there's not as much overlap between the electron and hole wave functions. So they're not as radially active. You have a lower oscillator strength. So they have corresponding longer lifetimes. So the presence of the static dipole and plus this longer lifetime has a lot of people excited because you might be able to observe very interesting phenomena like the formation of, say, bosons ion condensation, you know, where the, all of the um, exa, um, excitons will, you know, condensed down to the lowest quantum state, for basically a big macroscopic quantum state that people have seen in cold atom systems. Um, also the static dipole gives you, so they have this dipolar field that can interact in a similar way to electrons do materials, you can maybe have correlated exciton physics. So this, particularly this heterostructure here is a very hot topic now in the 2D materials field. A lot of work is being done to see these interesting physical phenomena associated with these indirect excitons. What a trouble with doing this uh, for TAPL room temperature is that they're typically pretty dim because you have this lower ox oscillator strength and indirect um, ex um, momentum mismatch, this indirect character where the momentum is mismatched. You don't have strong emissions, so they're difficult to observe in far field spectroscopy just um, when you're at room temperature. You usually have to go to low temperature to see a lot of these effects. But I wanted to look at and see what nanobubbles did when you form the nanobubble and how does strain affect the um, variables of physics of these intralayer isotons. Now you might ask the question, do nanobubbles really form at all when you form heterostructures that are two or three layers thick? That's because you have a correspondingly thicker plate, so it's going to be stiffer, maybe not as likely to form nanobubbles, maybe not nearly as likely to form wrinkles. The answer of forming nanobubbles though is clearly yes, so this is an example of a heterostructure. 
So they don't have a marsh, but this is the heterostructural region right about here. You can kind of see the border right here. Right down here is tessinide selenide. This is a bit of the molly diselenide that you know drapes over the top plate right here. This is a big thick piece of molly diselenide. So I have a box here hiding a couple free nanobubbles here. I do that for a reason. If you look at the um, average spectra of that box, you get an image that looks like this. So we seem to have PL from both the aceton species. So this is a far field PL map. So this would presumably be the tungsten diselenide aceton. This would be the molybdenum diselenide aceton. And the fact that you see both peaks indicates that, yeah, you are forming nanobubbles of both materials, not just the top material. Because if they were just fully in contact with the gold, you get the ultra fast air quenching that happens when you have a fluorescent emitter in contact with metal. So they're both delaminated a bit from the gold. They're both emitting, the acetons in those materials are both emitting very strongly, actually. So I did TEPL mass of each, these nanobubble, each of these three big nanobubbles in this field, and we got very interesting maps that look like this. I'm going to go through some of the spectra of each of these nanobubbles to show you how complicated they are. So focus on this guy right here. I, we have this kind of ring structure that kind of shows up when we do 785 excitation. I look at a couple spectra from that ring structure. You have a really rich array of states going on. So in this indeed, you kind of have the sifted, you know, main exciton state. Say this be the moly diselenide exciton or the tesson diselenide exciton. You got a whole ladder of energy states increasing with lower energy. And just to give it orient you, the energy of the intralar exciton is about 300 MeV below the main exciton. So for, for tungsten diselenide, moly diselenide systems, that's a right about here between maybe 870 and about 940 nanometers. So we got a whole bunch of them missing right at that point. And even one peak that's even a little bit beyond what's usually observed with the intralar exciton at room temperature in these materials. So it looks like, yeah, we can, strain does affect these intralar acetons that we would presume it would, but we can see them very strongly at room temperature using TEPL methods. So, and this, and it, the ring and structure has a very complicated spectral center. So if I look at it at maybe a different point in the nanobubble, say these pixels right here, you get a very different spectral peak. Still in the range of the intralar acetone, but the relative strength of those peaks you saw before are very different. So we have a presumably a much more complicated strain state as you move to different points in the nanobubble. What I want to show this picture here is we even have a mission that appears to go past one micron. But, um, as far as I know, no one's really seen a mission that far to the red at room temperature in these materials. And also, just to keep in mind, this is a silicon CCD detector, so the quantum efficiency of our detector is really dropping pretty dramatically. I haven't corrected these spectra for that effect. So while this looks fairly like a broad fat peak, it probably is a lot more peak than you think because this spectra has a lot of lower quantum, our detector is much lower quantum efficiency here than compared to, say, 950 nanometers. So some pretty rich physics going on in this material. Just to kind of highlight that, the spatial spectral dependence, we can just do a movie, just integrating various bins, and seeing how the spectral changes. And one thing you'll notice, maybe my play a bit too quickly, I'll play it again, is that the size of this ring, when it shows up very dramatically as you go to a redder emission, but it appears to shrink as you go to redder and redder wavelengths. So we can kind of visualize that by integrating different bins and then, you know, project it overlaying them and seeing what, what the color spectra looks like. So basically make like an RBG type image. So I here have a higher resolution scan of that same nanobubble. Here's just some example spectra and they look like this. I'm gonna choose three different color channels, energetically ordered of course. So blue over here, green right here, red right here, and overlay the two images. You get this rainbow like structure of the ring in these nanobubbles. So it looks like the a lot of the intralar acetons are more strained as you go toward the center of the nanobubble, and they're a little bit less strained as you're on the outside, or at least judging by the emission and the correlating with that with the presumed strain profile. So you can ask if it's a similar pattern observed in the other free nanobubbles. Is it just particular, um, you know, just due to the vagaries of the strain in this particular nanobubble? Is it a universal feature or not? From the two other nanobubbles that I've gone dead on so far, it appears to be yes. We do have a consistent profile with the redder emission on the inside, the bluer the emission on the outside. We might presume that if we go to even redder and redder wavelengths, maybe this ring would shrink even more, but we're at the limit of the detection efficiency of a silicon CCD, so we need a, maybe an in-gas detector to really answer that question. So, very interesting data. I just wanted to 
discuss a bit like why we would expect such strong insular emission just due to strain or a lattice wrinkling. And the answer has to do with probably the momentum mismatch of these two excitons. So a big reason why they're dim is due to the lower overlap of the two wave functions, but also because you have this momentum mismatch. So if you look at the allowed light cones, this is the Fury calculations of the different momentum of the electron and hole. What areas are brighter than ones that are colored either um, blue or orange? And the color corresponds to different helicities of the um, emission polarization. They only occupy very discrete regions in the allowed momentum spaces. So like uh, when that's, if you have an insular exciton with momentum of match, it's actually optically dark. And, and you need to have some sort of um, bridge to bridge that momentum mismatch. This can be provided maybe by interaction with a phonon or maybe uh, the more lattice, which is the beat pattern that forms when you have a mismatch of the lattice constant or a twist in the two constituent crystals. So what strain might do, in particular what a wrinkle might do, is it gives you maybe a scattering center. It'll act like a point defect and maybe blur out these light cones a bit, giving you access to more momentum vectors, but also breaks symmetry very strong in the crystals. So maybe the selection rule this momentum, when they see this band structure isn't quite what's going on when you're in like an ultra sharp wrinkle. And maybe much more of this um, space is optically bright. So we basically expand the light cones of the insular exciton to make them bright, plus copying them with a plasmonic um, field to enhance the emission. You can get very substantial room temperature um, insular exciton emission in these materials. So a lot more work to do. You can ask a lot of questions about like what's the helicity of how solicity change, like when you do you know, controlled strain, you can look at maybe did it become single photon sources when you go to ultra low temperatures. So there's a lot of exciting experiments we want to do or waiting to get started up again so we can resume. But it's a very exciting field of the interplay of strain in, in the intralar exciton, which really hasn't yet been explored in the TD materials field to a great extent. So, and this is uh, leave my conclusions up. Yeah, it's a lot of interesting stuff going on in nanobubbles. Localized exciton states, atomic scale wrinkles, at least at low temperature single photon sources. Um, I can go, go on and on about the interesting physics, but I think I'll end here and open it up to questions. And thank you for your attention. I have no idea if anyone's clapping. I hope they're clapping. <laughs> uh, I am pretty sure there's a lot of clapping going on. <laughs> it is really hard to clap with all those webinars. Yeah. Um, I do have some questions over here, but they do seem a little long. So let me see if I can address this. Uh, Thomas, Sorry. nice stuff. Have you been able to accurately measure the electron hole binding energy in these 2D materials? I agree the theory indicates that they should be large and there is extra shifting in the energies of the optical absorption features that are likely due to the exciton energies, but measuring these have been difficult. We have similar issues with 1D quantum wires. I wonder if a combination of simultaneous optical excitation and STM can measure the binding energies. What are your thoughts? Oh, it's a complicated question. I mean, the last proposal is very interesting. I don't know offhand but the last part of that question. I have not estimated the binding energies of these excitons myself, but um, I'm going to refer you to a paper by my fellow grad student and Jim Sucks group, um, Kai Wan Yao, who, this is all far field techniques, but he used, you know, making transistors out of MOS2 and I almost call it photoluminescence excitation spectroscopy, was able to measure the binding energy of the exciton and MOS2 to be on the order of, if I remember this right, I haven't read this paper in a while, to be a few hundred, like around 500 million electron volts. I have not pardon me, measured it for the intral exciton or these localized exciton states. Uh, I'm not sure how it should change when you have this complicated strain profile. So it's a very interesting question that I have to really just say I don't know. But. Okay, I have another one actually from the same person. So let's see if this one is any easier. Do you know of a way to differentiate shifting of band gap energies associated with a strain due to A, external physical forces, such as those caused by your nanobubbles or physical compression or deformation, and B, strain associated with chemical changes in bonding, band structure, band bending, and lattice parameter? Ooh, uh, I mean, from just a TERS measurement, I'd say no. 
I'd say you'd have to do uh, several experiments in controlled atmospheres to see this, or like controlled environments at least. So it's ideally you would do an experiment, say, in vacuum, and then we just have there's no radical species, you know, like uh, interact with your sample, like water vapor, and then you measure the it strain via TERS in that geometry, then you go to some sort of controlled chemical environment that you then measure the strain again with a flat sample where you characterize beforehand has no external physical strain, or at least you know what the external physical strain is. I mean, differentiating them just from the TERS itself, I don't know. It sounds like it'd be very hard. Maybe there's, I'm just gonna, I'll leave it there. I don't wanna get myself in trouble by speculating. I'd say it's a hard differenti differentiation to make just from spectroscopy alone. Okay, thank you. There's a couple of people here that are just writing that they are clapping. So, like I said. And then the, the last person here is asking, oh no, there's a couple more coming on. But one person here is asking if you could repeat your first five slides because the sound was bad and they couldn't understand. I'll just uh, start again. Uh, they were mostly introduction. Um, I'll just do it. Um, just to cycle through the, uh, so this is just introducing the technique, wax tons are, what a nanobubble is, scale comparison. They're about the same size of a virus. Um, typically smaller, actually, most of the time. Um, this is just to show the resolution enhancement from doing near-field techniques and then the particular low energy emission of the nanoballs themselves. So when you do hyperspectral imaging, particularly, you can really pick out these localized isoton states. And that's a real strength of doing this kind of measurements, especially resolve mapping, not just intensity mapping of a, of a sample. Uh, all right, bring them on. Let's, okay. Yeah, go. <laughs> See what else is there. When bringing the tip close to a bubble, how do you know that the shift to lower energy is not due to a change in confinement potential caused by a change in local environment that should also cause a shift to lower energies? Yeah, exactly. That what the strain is a change in local environment, definitely. Um, does he mean dielectric strain? Yes, that will have an effect also because you'll have a metallic tip and you're, you know, shrinking a metallic gap. So you're going to change the uh, relative strain of the exotones. Yeah, that will have an effect also. And really, the way to differentiate that, I think you need to do modeling um, of what your emitters are, which is pretty tricky in these states. It's actually not easy to tell what. Um, states are going to be strongly coupled to the optical field. Yeah. So there's a lot of work to be done in this um, understanding of all of the shifts in exciton energy um, when you're in these very highly localized environments like a nanobubble. There's also a question of what's inside the nanobubble itself. We presume it's like hydrocarbons or water vapor. But when we try to do like Raman spectroscopy to see it, to see the vibrations of say the CH modes, uh, I mean, you basically blow the nanobubbles up by the time you get sufficient intensity to observe that sort of Raman scattering. So there's the mystery of what the trap material is and all the different effects of the um, changing local environments in addition to the strain that's going to confine the excitons. Yeah. It's a very good point. <laughs> Let me do one more over here. Is there, possible in yeah. is there a possible inhomogeneous interface charge distribution in the bubble area that forms varying dipole? Has this been taken into consideration? Lots of, lots of, a lot of smart people here. Yes, no, I have not taken it into consideration. And yes, as, as you presume, there's a lot of charge transferring happening between the tip, the tip's in contact and the tip is metallic, between the, um, the monitor, the, basically between the semiconductor and the tip, or between the substrate and the tip. Um, okay. Uh, is there any possibility to develop polarization resolution capability for the near field PL? Any modifications on the geometric shape of the tip will work? Ge geometric modifications will modify the polarization response to the tip. 
it tends to be once you get to these small scales or below the wavelength, you're going to mix polarizations a lot. So it's not, it's a general problem you can find the, even with a focused laser spot, you don't have a pure polarization. You have different polarizations all over the place. So it's really hard to know what port, it's so hard to get a pure linear polarized or circularly polarized light. Generally, from simulations, we do know the prominent polarization like gap mode is blonde that like perpendicular to the sample, basically between the gap, the surface, and the apex of the tip. There's an alternative tip that we use sometimes where it's not a tip enhanced technique, it's more of an aperture based technique. You may look at something called the Campanile probe. And this uses a waveguide type geometry to get a in plane polarization or strong in plane polarization, in addition to having, you know, some out of plane polarization as well. But it works by a different principle. It's completely local excitation. There's no diffraction of the laser spot. Got a lot of advantages. It's just a very hard tip to make. You only make them seldom when you really want to. There's work, there's work, I'll just pre about there's work happening to commercialize these tips, but they're still in development. But keep your eyes out for a Campanile tip or uh, basically a type of waveguiding type aperture based tip. But yeah, you can do that. Okay. To some extent, yeah. Sounds complicated. Yeah. For the experiment, you dig the tip down. Which modes of AFM is it? Is it contact mode or tapping mode? So the TPL is typically done in spec top mode, in the same way of Patrick's measurements and Andre's measurements. So that's contact. For the AFMs, I said they're all tapping. So we do tapping to get the map, like a good quality map. And then we do you know light contacts. We don't press too hard to do the TPL. Mapping. Okay. Yeah. Not another maybe trick question. How do you define the spatial resolution? Full width, half max? Oh, that's a <laughs> controversial question for microscopy. Um, I, I try to use the word localization rather than resolution, but usually, like, is there distinguishing features either in the intensity so that the intensity drop off by at least a factor of E? Or do you have like distinct spectra by some separation, even if the integrated intensity doesn't show a strong difference? So in this way, your spectra can act as a different, you know, um, channel of information in the kind of same way when you do far field super resolution techniques, you use some other channel of information to localize your emitters to smaller than the diffraction mode of light. So that's typically how I try to define our resolution here. In this map here that's still on the screen, I mean, you can just see a clear contrast in the optical signal. So this is about 40 nanometer resolution if you're being really conservative. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. How about the reproducibility of nanobubbles and size of a nanobubble? They're, they vary a lot in sizes. So they're reproducible is that you tend to get more, most of them in like the one nanometer to 10 nanometer height, and then bigger ones and bigger ones are comparably rare. Smaller ones are hard to see, so we're not sure how rare they are. They tend to be in that range. And the strain distribution, when they're in this limited size, at least if you assume a uniform plate, is actually about the same. They tend to have a uniform aspect ratio when they're of this size. So you have about a 1% strain in nanobubbles of all sizes. So the pressures inside are very different from a big nanobubble that has small pressure. If you have like a, maybe a half nanometer size nanobubble, you have like a gigapascal pressure versus maybe like 10 megapascals for a 100 nanometer radius bubble or more like 200 megapascal. Okay. Yeah. Well, Tom, thank you so much. I mean, this has been a fantastic talk. I learned thank a you. lot. Nano bubbles, <laughs> and we all learned a lot. We answered most of the questions for you. Um, so yeah, I think we will wrap up the event with that. I wanted to thank all of our speakers. I wanted to thank Tom. Uh, given the technical difficulties, he still managed to call in and actually walk us through his slides. And of course, Patrick and Andre gave fantastic talks as well fortunately without much technical difficulties. And um, thank you all attendees for coming over and uh, enjoying our 
our annual event. Uh, I have no idea what's going to happen next year. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to host it again in person. But given the the level of interest, we might be able to also broadcast it on Zoom if that is something that would be of interest. Uh, I would really appreciate whoever is logging out and when we end the when we end the event for you to fill out that survey that should pop out the moment you log off. And if it, this is something you would like to see in the future, or if you would like to see the in-person um, event also broadcasted, please let us know. And uh, thank you. I hope you had fun. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Marcin. Marcin? Hold on a second, let me finish, pause, stop recording. Um, I can't stop the broadcast, so we're still live. That's fine. Uh, I actually have a very open question. Would it be possible to have the list of questions that